You guys, grab a seat. Man, I love that song, In Christ Alone. What a powerful uh, worship song. And I'm excited for us to be jumping in. Before we jump into God's Word, um, yesterday was uh, Veterans Day. And I want to take a moment. I always love this Sunday because I love taking a chance to honor our veterans. If you are a veteran of any military branch, or I would also like to say, if you are the spouse of a veteran that has passed away. So if you're a veteran or the spouse of a veteran, that's, would you do me a favor? Would you just stand so we could honor you right where you are? Just stand. We're so thankful for you. Amen. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. I want to say as, as just wholeheartedly as I can this morning, thank you. We're so grateful for you. Uh, we realize you said yes to that act of service before anybody was applauding you for it. And we're very grateful, uh, realizing that what we get to do and, and what we get to enjoy, so much of that is because you said yes to that call. And I just want to tell you that we are so grateful for you this morning. And I'm excited for us to jump into God's Word. Why don't you grab your Bible and head to 1 Corinthians? That's where we're going to be, where we'll spend most of our, well, all of our time uh, today. We'll be in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be looking uh, really at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. Now, don't have a panic attack wondering, is the preacher, he was gone last week. Is he about to try to preach three chapters of the Bible? I knew we should have skipped. What are we doing here, right? Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, well, kind of, but not really. All right, so um, we're, we're going to continue discovering the spiritual gifts uh, today, and uh, Pastor Ben laid a, a strong foundation for us last week, and one of the most important things that he said, I, I want to say again, which is this. He said, the Christian life is undeniably and unavoidably a supernatural life. That's one of the things that Pastor Ben said last week, and I want us to see this, right? This, the Christian life is not a life that's meant to be lived in our own power, in our own ability, and our own talent. The Christian life is undeniably and unavoidably a supernatural life, meaning it's a life that's meant to be lived not just knowing about the supernatural power of God, but experiencing it ready and seeing it expressed through us. And the reason this is so important, church, is because if we don't resonate with that, that our life is meant to see supernatural things happen. If we don't resonate that the Christian life is a supernatural life, we will never do what Paul tells us to do in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, when he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. We will never desire the supernatural gifts of God if we don't believe our life is meant to display the supernatural power of God. But if you believe that your life is meant to know, experience, and display the supernatural power of God, do you know what you're going to do? You're going to pursue the gifts that give you that power, right? So it's just important that we see this Christian life is not some life we wander through and it makes us a little better. It's literally a life that's meant to give us supernatural uh, power because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's really what these these two weeks, last week and this week, are for, um, my, my prayer has been that they would kind of awaken in us a desire for the gifts of the Spirit, wake us up for a desire to see the power of God at work in our church, and it would be that we would be stirred up a, as a spiritual family to earnestly desire and pray for um, and see the spiritual gifts expressed in our lives and in our church. And that's really what we're going to look at today, is what does that look like when the gifts are expressed in the church? And Pastor Todd and I were talking about this a little bit this week, and he had a great analogy, and I thought, well, I'll just steal from him rather than try to think of my own, because that's easy sometimes, right? <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. I'm giving him credit for it. And so uh, he was saying, you know, I th he said, I think about it kind of like a, a basketball team. You got your players on the court. Uh, every player knows their role. Every player knows what they're supposed to do. 
Every player values the other players on their team. You've got the referees that are making sure the rules of the game are enforced. You have the boundaries of the game that are clearly defined. And as long as all of those things are happening, players know their job, do their job. Players value the other players and their gifting. Um, Boundaries are enforced. Rules are in place. As long as that happens, the game thrives and the game is enjoyable. But when that doesn't happen, what happens? The game becomes chaos, which, by the way, is every pickup game of basketball I ever played, right? I've never fouled in my life, and I've never taken a shot where I wasn't fouled. That's just the reality of my basketball game, right? And so it becomes chaos, right? It just devolves. Listen, the same is true when it comes to the spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts are given to cause the body of Christ to thrive, Caused there to be joy in the body, life in the body, to strengthen us. But that only happens when every member knows their gift and walks in their gift, when the the biblical boundaries of the spiritual gift are in place, when the gifts are uh, expressed in an orderly way according to the Scriptures, and every member values the gifts in other members. That's the only way that happens. So Paul spends a lot of his letter to the Corinthian church talking about this. And one of the reasons it's a worthwhile pursuit for us today is because um, we tend to find ourselves on one of two extremes, right? We find ourselves on one of two extremes. I bet this is going to grab most people in the room. You, you either kind of find yourself in the camp where you go, you know what, I just assume stay as far away from spiritual gifts as possible because I don't know about them. I don't think I want to know about them. I'm a little worried about them. They scare me. Uh, and, and I'm going to just stay away as, as far away from them as possible. I've lived this long without them. I'm doing fine, right? Or the other end of that extreme is almost a charismania approach right? And wherever you find yourself on that spectrum has a lot to do with the experiences you've had growing up in the church, right? So the way I was kind of brought up, the spiritual gifts, they may have been at times a thing that were talked about, but they were never desired and certainly never pursued and never expressed in a public fashion. So I was raised that the gifts are a mystery and and many of them something to be feared, quite frankly, right? You may have been brought up in a different church experience where um, it it, maybe it was a hyper, uh, maybe more emotional kind of an everybody expressing gifts, maybe an everybody speaking in tongues all at once. It felt a little bit chaotic, and you may have experienced times where you thought the spiritual gifts were being abused. And wherever you are on that spectrum, I want you to hear me say this: one, you're not alone because that fear and that chaos has been going on since the the beginning. Since the church was founded, that's been going on. So Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church. He's dealing with this because there are people in this church on both ends of that spectrum. And the way Paul begins to deal with this and clarify our view of this, listen, is not to focus on the experience of the gift, but to focus on the encounter with the Holy Spirit. Right? Every expression of a spiritual gift is an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That's the point, and that's Paul's focus here. The church in Corinth was one of the most gifted churches in the New Testament. What, I'm telling you, one of the most spiritually gifted churches of all the New Testament churches, here's the issue, it was also one of the most spiritually immature. And that spiritual immaturity shaped how they viewed the gifts and shaped how they expressed the gifts. And so what Paul, that's why Paul deals with this so much. More than any other place in the Bible, the gifts are dealt with in the letters to the Corinthian church, right? And so what Paul teaches them, and I think for us is really important, which is when we see the gifts being misused or abused, or we see a fear of the gifts, or a lack of pursuing the gift, here's what's most important. The issue is not with the gift, The issue is with our understanding of it and with our expression of it, right? And so Paul devotes 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 to this issue. 
1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 are all about the spiritual gifts. Now, if you know your Bible, that may throw you off a little bit, right? Because we look at 1 Corinthians 13, and we go, wait a minute, that's a different. We call that, what do we call 1 Corinthians 13? What is it? The love chapter. <laughs> you know our love was meant to be, right? And so, <laughs> you... <laughs> We call it, the, there hadn't been a wedding in a thousand years that hasn't used 1 Corinthians 13, right? But here's something I want you to see. 1 Corinthians 12 is all about what the spiritual gifts are. 1 Corinthians 14 is all about how the gifts operate in the church. Wedged right between there is 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul gives us the motivation and the foundation for the gifts, which is love. Those three chapters are all about the gifts of the Spirit. So what I want to do today is acknowledge, first of all, that two weeks on the spiritual gifts is not enough, and I know that. Um, much of what you will discover about the gifts, this is meant to whet the appetite, not to be an exhaustive uh, <clears throat> set of lessons. If you want to discover this, and we're going to discover, Paul's going to make clear, every believer should desire this because he says, earnestly desire, right? This is going to require that you take time to open God's word, spend time in prayer, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, reveal to you, and see these gifts come alive in you, right? So what I want to do for each of these chapters is kind of give a summary statement for each of them and then unpack that. Uh, and, and, and by the end, we'll, I hope we'll have something of a firm, firmer foundation. So let's start with 1 Corinthians 12. Let me give you kind of the summary statement, and then we'll begin to unpack it. 1 Corinthians 12, here's the statement. All spiritual gifts are empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. We won't spend a lot of time here. Um, Pastor Ben laid a foundation for us uh, there last week, but this is vital to remember and to understand and to embrace this truth. All spiritual gifts are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. We're going to read 4 through 7, and then we'll jump to verse 11. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who, say that word, empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So that's what Paul's saying. Now, for the next few verses, Paul walks through some specific gifts, and every time he affirms that gift is from the Holy Spirit. And then you get to verse 11, and he says this All of these gifts, all of these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So over and over, Paul says these gifts come from the Spirit, and they're empowered by the Spirit. Why does that matter? Because spiritual gifts are not the result of natural talent. We want them to be that, don't we? We want our gifts to be just things that we're naturally good at, but that's not the way spiritual gifts work. Spiritual gifts are not the result of natural talent. Spiritual gifts are a supernatural impartation of the Holy Spirit of a thing you didn't have before, and now you do. Right? A thing you couldn't do before, and now you can. It, it, it's a gift in that way. And the reason Paul gives this teaching is because in Corinth, the, the reason Paul is wanting them to understand these gifts are empowered by the Holy Spirit and they come from the Spirit is because in the church, there were some who were elevating their gift above others. There were some who were devaluing their gift. There were some who were discouraged and frustrated because they didn't have certain spiritual gifts. There was envy, there was boasting, there was arrogance, there was pride. All of this stuff was going on. And what Paul wants to do is bring everybody back to the reality. He gives value to all the spiritual gifts, listen, not based on their expression, but based on their origin. I want to say that again. Paul gives value to all the spiritual gifts, not based on their expression, but based on their origin, based on where they came from. So right now, on the top shelf in my closet at home... Um, 
there's a box, a round hat box. I'm not a hat guy because I have a head the size of a, a watermelon. But in that box is my grandfather's cowboy hat, my, my mother's dad, John Gall. And I love that hat. I got that hat, and I got his uh, Masonic belt buckle, right? I never knew what it was growing up. I just always thought it looked cool. But um, when he passed and when my grandmother passed, um, I know that other members of our family may have gotten little things like that. Um, and I look at that hat, and I look at that belt buckle, and I don't value those things because someone else told me they were valuable. Listen, and I certainly don't value them in comparison to what other family members might have gotten. I value them because of their origin. I value them because of, of where they came from. Listen, it's the same with the spiritual gifts. There are some gifts that when they're expressed, they're more visible. They're more vocal. Some gifts are less visible, less vocal. But the value of the spiritual gift is not in the volume of the expression but in the origin of the gift. Every spiritual gift is empowered by and from the Holy Spirit. So I just want to lay that down as the groundwork. That's really the heart of chapter 12. Chapter 12 talks about we're all members of one body and every member has a gift. So I want you to hear me. Pastor Ben said it last week. I want to affirm it this week. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been given a spiritual gift, and it is imperative that you know it and you learn to walk in it, because the body needs it. The body needs your spiritual gift. I just want to, I want to say that. It's from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 13. What's kind of the big idea here? It's this. That love should be our motivation when using spiritual gifts. Love should be our motivation when using spiritual gifts. So at the end of chapter 12, Paul is talking about how gifts should unify us. We're lots of different members, but we're one body, right? And the way the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are unified, they are the ones working the gifts in us. So that means the spiritual gifts should be a unifying reality in the church. And then at the very end of 1 Corinthians 12, the last verse, verse 31, Paul says this, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Now, a quick note on that phrase, earnestly desire the higher gifts, because we might look at that and go, what does that mean? Some gifts are better than others, you know? That's why they were fighting. Paul told them, you got some that are high, some that are low. When Paul says earnestly desire the higher gifts, he's not meaning higher in terms of importance or quality. And remember, he's writing this letter to a church, and he's trying to bring order back into a church that's descended into chaos. So when he says earnestly desire the higher gifts, he's talking about the gifts that have a greater usefulness in the public gathering. That's what he's talking about. Okay, These are the gifts that have a greater usefulness in the public gathering. But then he says this. He, 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 he lays out the gifts in 12, how each member needs to walk in their gifts, how we all don't have the same gifts. And then he says, now I will still show, I will show you a more excellent way. Or... In other words, let me show you what matters most when it comes to the gifts and how to walk in these gifts in excellence. 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So now he's going to start telling us, if we operate in the spiritual gifts, but we don't love, Right? So here he says, you, could, you can have the heavenly language of tongues. You can speak in tongues. You can, you can speak in this eloquent heavenly language and speak tongues better than anyone. But if you don't have a love in your heart, you're just making noise. That's Paul's point. Verse 2, and if I have prophetic power, so the gift of prophecy, Right? And I understand all mysteries, and I have all knowledge, so I have the gift of wisdom and knowledge. And if I have all faith, the gift of faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. Paul says you can have the gift of prophecy, wisdom, knowledge, and faith, and those gifts don't make you a thing if the foundation isn't love. 
The next thing he says, is, if I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. What's he saying? If, if you have the spiritual gift of generosity and you're even to, to give everything that you have away, even willing to give your own life away, but love is not the motivation, then what you gave away was for self-exaltation and it didn't gain you a single thing. Now, some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, so generosity is a spiritual gift. Well, that's why I don't give. Pastor, I just don't have the gift. I'm off the hook. <laughs> Listen, you heathen, spiritual <laughs> generosity is for every believer. And if you don't have a rhythm of generosity, not only are you walking in disobedience to God's word, you are missing one of the greatest blessings God has for you. But there are some who are given a unique spiritual gift of generosity. Okay? So Paul says you can give it all away, but if it doesn't come from love, it doesn't gain you anything. Here's why. Verse 4. Because love is patient and love is kind. What does he mean by that? It means love is going to tolerate the weaknesses and the inaccuracies in others In our spiritual giftings, love is going to be patient with those who are learning to grow and walk in their gifting, right? He says, um, love does not, excuse me, love love does not envy or boast, right? So love doesn't look at someone else's gifting with jealousy. Love doesn't boast about the gift that I have. He says, love is not arrogant or rude, so it doesn't shame others for their gift. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It is not resentful. So we don't look at others' gifts and get irritated at them if love is our motivation. Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, And endures all things. What's he saying? Love is going to put up with one another. Love is going to believe the best for each other. Love is going to find hope in what God is doing in other people's lives. And love is going to endure through the process of maturing in the gifts. That's what Paul is saying here. Why is he having to say that? Because family, as we learn to walk in our spiritual gift, we're not going to be perfect at it. We're going to make mistakes. We're not going to get it right every time. If you have the gift of prophecy and God puts a word in your heart for someone or for the church, there may be times where you miss it. Does that mean you don't have that spiritual gift? Does that mean you should never listen to the Holy Spirit again? No, it means love is patient. (laughs) Love is kind. Love gives room to grow. Right? That's the point here. Love is going to endure through this process of maturity. Here's why. Verse 8. Because love never ends. As for prophecies, they will, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. What's Paul saying? The spiritual gifts are not forever. The spiritual gifts are for now. They're for this moment. Therefore, between this moment and when Christ returns to perfect all things, between now and this moment, we have the gifts. But when Christ returns and all things are perfected, the gifts will no longer be needed. So Paul is saying the gifts are not going to last forever. But what is eternal? What is going to endure is the motivation and the foundation of the spiritual gifts, and that is love. That's Paul's point. So if love for other believers is not our motivation in how we use our spiritual gift, then our gift is worse than worthless. It's dangerous. Are you with me? If our spiritual gift is not expressed through the supreme value of love, it is deficient at best and destructive at worst. Love transcends every spiritual gift. 
every one of them. Love is more important, it's more valuable, and it is more beneficial to the body of Christ than the collective power of tongues, prophecy, healing, and miracles. Why? Because love is what makes power healthy. Love is what makes power beneficial. Love is what makes power edifying to the body. Love is what makes power glorifying to God. But power without love is abuse. Power without love is abuse. And I very distinctly felt in my spirit this week, the Holy Spirit say, there are going to be people in the room who feel in a painful way, what I mean when I say that. That there are some people that have been hurt by the church. You've been hurt by people in authority operating in a spiritual gift. And the motivation wasn't love and it caused harm and not blessing. And if that's you, I just want to say this morning, one, That shouldn't have happened. It didn't please the Lord. I'm sorry that it happened. And for some of you, that has caused you to push away from your spiritual gift. It's caused you to push away from being open to the Holy Spirit using you because you were told He's not going to and can't ever. And I just want you to hear me say, the Holy Spirit wants you to find freedom and healing from that. And New Beginnings is a place um, where I hope you can pursue your gift and learn to walk in your gift and see this as a safe place to express it. Because we need it. This body needs your gift. And if you don't walk in your gift, we are weakened. So if that's you, I just had that on my heart for three days. If that's you, man, I want want this to be a place where you find freedom from that hurt. And you learn to love the Holy Spirit again. And you love to pursue that gift again. Because the body needs it. Love must always be our motivation when using the spiritual gifts. Chapter 14. Look how fast I'm preaching whole chapters of the Bible. Man. Chapter 14, spiritual gifts in public settings must be practiced orderly. Must be practiced orderly. All right? So at the very end of 13, Paul says some of our favorite verses. By the way, if you have these words on a wall or a something somewhere, it's a screensaver on your phone, I just want you to raise your hand. Faith, hope, and love remain, but the greatest of these is love. How many of you have that in your house somewhere? Okay, great, wonderful. I'm not making fun of you. It's at my house too, right? I just wanted to know, right? We love those verses. Paul says that at the end of 13. Faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. So what does he say? So pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Hmm. We love half that verse We get squirmish on the other half. We just wanted him to say, so pursue love, period, next chapter, next subject. But that's not what Paul does. Remember, all of these chapters are about the gifts of the Spirit. He says, pursue love and earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to look at the two two gifts he deals with primarily in chapter 14, which is prophecy and tongues. We're going to look at those. We're going to try to define them. Um, because I think those are two of the gifts that cause the most uh, angst and worry and unsteadiness and fear, right? But I don't, I don't want us to miss what Paul said right there, and I want us to rest in it. Paul said, pursue love and earnestly desire the gifts. He said to earnestly desire them. Our tendency is to pursue love and to earnestly try to define them. What do I mean by that? I mean, typically what 
we want to do is we don't want to de- we don't want our heart to desire anything that we can't control and fully understand and feel like we've got a full grip on. So we don't want our heart to desire anything. And since we don't feel like we've got a grip on the gifts, we don't desire them. Am I talking to anybody beside myself right now? Right? We want it to say, pursue love and earnestly define the spiritual gifts. But that's not what Paul says. He says, earnestly desire them. But we tend, to, we tend to treat the spiritual gifts almost like a job fair. Well, give me all the details of the position. Tell me everything about it. Let me see if it's a fit for me, right? Do, let me see what I like about it. Not too challenging. May Oh, that feels within reach. Okay, I'll let that be my spiritual gift. That is not at all how this works. It's not at all how this works. What Paul emphasizes here is a, is a command to desire this thing, to run after them, to pursue them. That reflects a a posture of the heart. It reflects a posture of the heart, not a knowledge in the mind. Right? That earnestly desire comes from a Greek word called zeloo. Zeloo. It's where we get our word zealot or zealous. It means to burn with desire. That's what it means. That's that's how Paul wants us to pursue the gifts. Like a zealot. To be fierce in our pursuit of the spiritual gift. To zealously burn with a desire for the spiritual gifts. Right? What's he say? We're supposed to pursue love and pursue this ever-increasing desire for the spiritual gifts. Why? Because they bless the church. Because they build up the body. And if our motivation is love, then we're going to want to bless others and edify the church and love the church the way Christ did. And Paul's emphasis through, the, through everything he wrote about the gifts, his emphasis was not to, in detail, tell us exactly what the gift is, but to drive us to desire the gift to be at work in the church. So I want to look at those two gifts first in, of, of prophecy in tongues. Let's see what Paul has to say about them here in 1 Corinthians 14. Back to verse 1. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up. Don't hear that as puffs himself up with pride. Meaning, tongues is primarily a gift that edifies the the individual believer. That's what Paul means right there. So the one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up or edifies, strengthens himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. Interesting statement. Now, I want all, I want you all to speak in tongues. Y'all just want to sit there and squirm for a few minutes with that? (laughs) I believe there is a, a better Greek translation, but it isn't far from that. I think the better translation would be, I wish you all could speak in tongues, is... I think the better translation, but even that, boy, hear the heart of what Paul's saying. I wish you could all speak in tongues. I want you all to be able to do this. Right? But notice what he says next. But even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. Again, not greater in authority or in stature, but in that usefulness in the public setting. Unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So here's what was happening. There was a misunderstanding of the purpose of spiritual gifts in the corporate gathering in the church in Corinth. And some gifts, because of their volume and their visible nature, were getting overused and used out of order. 
and causing chaos in the church, specifically the gift of tongues, which is why Paul focuses on these two in chapter 14. Really, all of 14 is about these two gifts, right? And so what I want to do is I want to try to give a, some broad brushstroke definitions of the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. That's what I want to try to do. And I want to acknowledge right here and now, in no way, shape, or form, is my goal to answer every question. All right? We are scratching the surface. My goal is that we would be stirred up to just do what God's Word tells us to do, which is to earnestly desire the gifts. All right? So, let's start with uh, tongues. Tongues is this. Tongues is when the Holy Spirit empowers an individual to pray to God and worship God in an unintelligible language, a language known only to God. That's what it is to speak in tongues. I'm going to leave it up if you want to take a picture of it or if you a fast writer. When the Holy Spirit empowers an individual to pray to God and worship God in an unintelligible language, a language known only to God. So look at verse 2 of chapter 14. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. What does he mean by utters mysteries in the Spirit? I want to tell you, we don't know exactly what that is. It could be a, a, a personal language the Holy Spirit produces in a person that's understandable only to God and, and, and has a unique way to communicate with him, like a personal prayer language. It could be a heavenly language. In this context, what we know is Paul says it's an unintelligible language. Paul says men can't understand it. So that's, that's what Paul says tongues are. But he also talks about the interpretation of tongues, which I want to be clear. What Paul makes crystal clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is this. The gift of tongues is never for the body of the public gathering, unless you have the gift of the interpretation of tongues. That's just, that is crystal clear in God's Word. The gift of tongues is never for the body unless someone is given the gift of interpretation. And you're asking yourself, all right, big boy, well, what are you going to do one day when somebody stands up in here and speaks in tongues? I'm so, because I've thought about this. Because here's why I've thought about it. If I'm going to be open to the spiritual gifts, my heart can't be closed to any of them. If someone were to stand and speak in tongues, we would wait and we would pray. And we would ask the Holy Spirit, will you give someone in this room the gift of interpretation? If that is for the body, will you give someone the gift of interpretation? And we'll just wait and ask the Holy Spirit to move. If the Holy Spirit doesn't, then we'll, make, we'll, we'll acknowledge what Paul says. Then that tongue was not for the body. But I will not tear down a believer. I will not tear someone down. And if, if that You want to know why? Because love is patient and love is kind. And it doesn't envy and it doesn't boast and it isn't rude. It isn't arrogant. Okay? So that's the gift of tongues. Let's talk about the interpretation of tongues. It's exactly what you think it is. When the Holy Spirit enables a person to supernaturally understand the unintelligible language in a way that can be communicated for the edifying of the church. So if someone has the gift and they speak to tongues and then the Holy Spirit gives someone else the gift of interpretation where now that tongue is able to be understand and communicated for the body in a way that builds us up. Why? Because every gift is for building us up. Every gift is for building us up. And I want to say this. Through the years, I have seen, maybe like many of you, the gift of tongues be abused. And I want to tell all of our little Baptist hearts in this room right now, the fact that it has been abused is no excuse for it to be relegated to the sideline. Because what I've also seen is men and women, godly men and women, walk in this gifting in a way that is within the biblical bounds and it is edifying for them and for the church. I've seen that too. 
So that's tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Prophecy. When Paul talks about prophecy, we can't hearken backward to like an Old Testament prophet. It's not what he's talking about. The Old Testament prophets, your Isaiah's, your Jeremiah's, these were, these were people set up as authority figures to stand between God and men and men and God, right? That's not what the, the New Testament gift of prophecy is. So I want to be sure we make that delineation. Here's the New Testament gift of prophecy. Prophecy is when the Holy Spirit supernaturally reveals something to a person they would not otherwise know that is meant to be communicated to a person or people for the purpose of building them up in Christ. So that's the gift of prophecy. There are people who have the spiritual gift of prophecy where the Holy Spirit will reveal something to them about someone else or for someone else. And it's meant to be communicated to them or to a group of people for building them up in Christ. Listen, we've seen this happen in this room on Wednesday nights. We've seen it happen in Longview. When we gather together and we pray and we ask for the Holy Spirit to show up and we're open to whatever He wants to do, I've watched words of prophecy be spoken in this place to build up the body of Christ. This has happened in my life. It's happened in my own life. God has given me words for people and He has given people words for me. I'll give you an example of that and then then we'll be done. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, I'd been leading worship for a long time, 20 years maybe. And I, I knew God was calling me out of that. And I felt called to preach and teach. I had for years, but I'd never told anyone. And, uh, b- but I knew that, that that change was coming. And I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I, I was afraid that I was going to have to leave New Beginnings. And we loved, Carrie and I loved this church. We didn't want to leave. But there were five men that God had put in positions of preaching and teaching at the church at that time. Right? There were five men. And I was like, man, God, if you're calling me to that, them five dudes are already doing that. What am I going to do? And I'm telling you all, when I say I was losing sleep and, and battling anxiety like I had never battled before, I'm being honest with you. Finally, I I asked Pastor Todd and and Pastor Connor if I could have a meeting with them and to just tell them, my goal was to tell them one of two things. Either one, um, here's where I am and I don't know what to do, or two, here's my letter of resignation, I'm out. Thank God I said the first thing, not the second thing. And I told them, I said, uh, I, I I don't know what to do with this, but I'm not supposed to be doing leading worship anymore. And I remember they were so, so good to me in that moment. And Pastor Connor said, we, we, we stopped and we prayed. We just prayed. And I distinctly remember him saying, Matt, I feel like the Lord wants me to say this to you. Um, God is bringing a change in your life. He is calling you to do something different but it is here at New Beginnings. And then he said this, if you will be patient, you will be blessed and so will our church. That was a word I didn't have in my heart. That whole, if you will be patient part. Understand, I went in to quit. But the Holy Spirit gave him that word in a moment. He he spoke it to me. Two years from that day, four of the five of those men were gone. And Todd Connitz called me into his office. He said, Matt, do you remember our meeting? Yes, sir, I do. He said, now I know why God wanted you to be patient. I think you're supposed to pastor the Gilmer Kings. I went, are you sure? (laughs) I mean, the evidence was clear, but I was still like, are you sure? So, I just want you to hear me say, church, the spiritual gifts are real. And we should not fear the Holy Spirit. We should not fear His power. 
we should not fear his gift. And Paul's solution to the chaos that was going on and the fear that was going on was not to push away and to cease and desist from the gifts, but to dive deeper and pursue the Spirit more and to pray more. That was his solution. That's what we're going to do here. We're not going to push away. We're going to dive in. We're going to pray more. We're going to ask for more. We're going to be patient with each other because we're not going to get it right. We're going to let love be supreme. And we're going to let the gifts bless the church. Amen. Man. God, I love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. Let it just change us and transform us in Jesus' name.